I have bought a new book. It's called Alchemy, the Divine Work by Tommy Westland and Tariana Falkenberg. It hasn't arrived yet. It has everything on it. You should get it. I'll have to check that out, Mal Val. It's nice to see you guys. Nice to be live. It should be going by now. But let's get into the alchemy. Feel free to comment anything else. I should write that book down. Um, we'll get into this. All right. So I wanted to start off with the books that I have that I want to be using. And one of them is The Alchemist's Handbook. And this is by Frater Albertus. And this is a wonderful book about plant alchemy, which is a little bit different than regular alchemy. And I just wanted to read a little bit here. It says, as previously explained, alchemical mercury is not the same as common quicksilver. Neither is sulfur common sulfur or brimstone, nor is salt common table salt or sodium chloride. Sulfur, that is the alchemical Sulfur is usually found in its own oily form adhering to the mercury. It must be separated by means of distillation. This yellow substance is the sulfur that common alcohol extraction did not set free sufficiently. With metallic sulfur, the difference will become even more noticeable. In the herbal process, the separation of the sulfur from the mercury, essence, is not as essential as in the mineral work. Therefore, the beginner will not use the three alchemical substances separately. So that tells you that with the mineral work, the key is to separate those three essences. And we know what those three essentials are. Salt, mercury, and sulfur. That is the goal of alchemy, is to separate those out first. That's what the first stage of alchemy is really about. So we are going over the negredo stage of alchemy, which contains, or phase, <laughs> It's the negredo phase of alchemy, and it contains two steps of alchemy. Now, I'm using the seven steps of alchemy because seven is actually the preferred number that most people go and use. I'm covering the Paul Foster Case 12 system right now in my videos, and I've been doing that series for a while. I just wrote the most recent video for that for, on fermentation. Step 11 is coming out soon. But... The seven stages is what's primarily used by most people, and that is what we're really going to focus on because even Paul Foster Case recognizes, and I just read this in the Hierophant because the Hierophant is the next tarot card that we're going to cover on my channel. He recognizes the seven stages of alchemy as being the main stages for alchemy, even though in his book, which I have here, this is Hermetic Alchemy, Science and Practice by Paul Foster Case. And in this book, he goes and explains the 12 steps of alchemy. And they correlate pretty closely to what D.W. Huck uses in his books. Now, I have two books by D.W. Huck. The first one, the more dense one, is A Sorcerer's Stone by Dennis William Huck. A Beginner's Guide to Alchemy. And his Alchemy Workbook, which is Exercises in Transformation. Now, you can't get his Alchemy Workbook on Amazon anymore. That's where I got it. It was when he was actually teaching classes. And so this is actually more like a workbook that you would get if you took an alchemy class. It's absolutely fantastic. It's gone through quite a bit with me. So, these are the sources that I primarily use. I do have the Book of Aquarius as well, but I have that digitally, so I don't, I can't show that to you. Eventually, I'll get an actual hard copy of that as well. I personally prefer hard copies because then I can make notes. You can tell from all the notations I have here, all the different notes that I take while I'm reading these books. But let's start off with dissolution, or sorry, with calcination. Calcination is the first stage, whether it's Paul Foster Case or D.W. Huck. In both the 12 system and the 7 system, calcination comes first. And the symbol for calcination is the crucible. That is one symbol for it. 
This is the one that I use in my videos on the seven stages of alchemy. This is the one that D.W. Huck uses. And it's an interesting symbol because it is, if you just changed it just a little bit, it would be the symbol for um, water or earth. But it's the downward pointed arrow, which are both used in alchemy as well because there's a bunch of alchemy symbols or glyphs. But it's slightly altered. It has this line coming and this is the crucible. Now the other symbol for calcination is the symbol of Aries. So Aries, the, the zodiac sign, correlates to calcination. And that is, if you look up in alchemy, if you look up the actual symbols, that will be one that will pop up more often than the crucible, will be the symbol for Aries, if you look at alchemy symbol charts. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm going to open a Sprite real quick. I just got home from being on the road. My husband has to test drive vehicles, and he had to test drive a vehicle today. Hi, Meg. It's good to see you. Aries is a fire sign, and the first dip of alchemy is fire. So the first alchemy step is associated with fire. And it is the phrase that goes with this alchemy step is its father is the sun. So this is the stage. So the phrase is from the book, um, the Hermetic Maxim. So it is actually, um, I can actually read the whole thing to you because it's here in Hermetic Alchemy. The first phrase goes with, <coughs> excuse me. Still getting over a little bit of a cold. It's the Emerald Tablet. I don't know if I can find it. I had no fi problem finding it earlier today. But I did not mark it. But the first line in the Emerald Tablet of Hermes is, Its father is the sun. And that correlates to calcination. So calcination, the symbol that I showed you is the crucible, and it is Aries, and it does work with the devil card, okay? Now, Paul Foster Case explains that calcination actually precedes the seven stages of alchemy. It is something that exists prior to the great work. So this is the stage that all of us start off in. It is the stage where we are burning with desire and that is what the devil card really represents here hi CG nice to see you and as you can tell these two can actually take off their chains at any time that is one of the most important things about the um, devil card is that you can actually they can they are willing participants in this situation so we all start off with this stage with calcination this is the normal state of human beings i had a couple quotes i wanted to share here but to start off with when it comes to alchemy in general it says in order to transform something this is from dw huck in order to transform something it must first be reduced to its most fundamental ingredients all the dross, falsity, and extraneous material must be removed. It is the job of the first two operations in the Emerald Formula to see that this purification is done correctly. After these two operations of fire and water, the essences of the matter at hand should be really readily available to be separated out of the remaining dark matter. So that's the key to calcination, is we're separating out the three essentials. And once again, those three essentials are sulfur, which is the soul, Mercury, which is the spirit, and salt, which is the body. Now, in plant alchemy, you keep the salt. And that's because it's different from the mineral um, alchemy that we study as a consciousness system. So, this is really the process. The first two stages is purification. Calcination is all about purification. Hello, hello Stephen. <laughs> so, that's what the Negredo stage is. It sounds very scary because it's the black stage of alchemy, right? But it's really about purification, and it's about purifying the consciousness 
oh thank you for the heart so it goes along with the symbol is the crucible which i've already shown it goes with lead and it goes with the planet saturn now aries and saturn doesn't seem to go too much together because saturn does not rule aries but we always start with saturn in alchemy we start off with the lead we start off with a lead in consciousness now paul foster case has a great description of calcination Seeing vanity is literally seeing falsehood, or seeing that which is not. Millions of persons today are the victims of just this kind of false vision. Everything they look upon is colored by their false interpretations, and by the false interpretations which they have received from the race subcon subconscious. It is as if they looked at the world through colored glasses. Some look through dark glasses, some through spectacles of rose tint. But here and there, one finds a knower of reality who sees the world as it really is and rejoices in the vision. Such knowers are few, but they all know the significance of the lambskin apron, and they have performed carefully this first stage of the great work. So basically, most people start off seeing the world darkly. Calcination correlates with the phrase burnout. All of us burn out. As Paul Foster Case said, this precedes the great work. D.W. Huck, in his Alchemy Workbook, describes people who fall under calcination. So he kind of uses the different stages of alchemy as personality types. And he says, psychologically, calcination is the destruction of the leaden center of consciousness, which is the ego, and all the illusions and self-deceptions. It maintains to protect or enshrine itself. Personal calcination means getting free of the stranglehold of earthbound ego and replacing it with the true self, which is rooted on a higher or golden plane of reality. For most of us, calcination is a natural humbling process as we are gradually assaulted and overcome by the trials and tribulations of life. People caught up in calcination often feel as if they are trapped in the fires of hell, burning up and suffering through their life, yet unable to escape. Surprisingly, it is not until these fires are burning that your transformation begins. For the only way out of hell is to rise up with the flames. Fortunately, controlled calcination can also be achieved. It begins with a deliberate surrender of our inherent hubris, hubris, pride or vanity, through a variety of spiritual disciplines that ignite the fire of introspection and self-evaluations. Fa its father is the sun, says the tablet of this first step in alchemy. So again, this is a stage of fire. So Negredo starts off with fire and ends with water. So calcination also is the root chakra and is Malkuth on the Kabbalah tree of life, which also corresponds to the root chakra. And let me go on a little bit. And I got a few quotes here. All right. Salt in the initial stages of alchemy represented stifled or lowered consciousness, which when raised through the seven steps dissolved and recrystallized into a higher form. This breakdown in crystallized thought or altering the belief systems is the primary objective of the first two operations of alchemy. So this is a breakdown is what we have in the Negredo stage. This is that dark night of the soul, that initial dark night of the soul where you have a complete breakdown. This is the normal state of human beings. Now in alchemy, the actual process, the experiment that you do in order to do calcination is you grind up the substance. You first you grind it and then you actually burn it. So it's reducing you down to ash. And that is the description and a very great metaphor for life itself. It reduces us down to ash, to our basic components, our basic, basic elements. And the reason why we do this on purpose, with focus concentration through meditation, is, and meditation is active in alchemy, okay? So this is writing in your journal. This is, you know, actually maybe even making an elixir, starting off by grinding the plant and then burning it just to get a sense of what, right, after a breakdown it follows a breakthrough. So you can do these things. Even burning incense is kind of a form of calcination. You're burning it down to ash. <coughs> ash. So this is the process that you can do. You can do this little things in life to symbolize this process. 
And that's exactly what it is, is there's a breakthrough right after a breakdown. But Negredo is really just the breakdown. The Negredo phase is just breakdown. I dropped the devil card, so I'll be right back. But you can see how most people start off this way. Now, I talked about this in the seven um, tarot card keys of alchemy and decoding alchemy. So I've kind of talked about this quite a bit. But we start off capable of freeing ourselves, capable of letting ourselves go. But we start off in the hellfire, basically, in alchemy. And what's really neat, as I shared this, these insights on the tarot before, but in the alchemy workbook, D.W. Huck actually lists, let's see if I can get it for you, lists the different seven tarot card keys of the seeker as corresponding to the different stages of alchemy. Exactly as I had assumed. And I had not really noticed that in this book. This book has all of it. It also corresponds to Malkuth and the chakras. So alchemists are into all these different systems. They know that the Saturnine chakra is the root chakra. And the root chakra is really the home of your inner child. It is that aspect that gets hurt. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it is the first stage where most people stay, which is safety. Until your needs for safety, your basic needs are met, you're not capable of higher thought. You're only going to be thinking about securing safety. So the alchemists knew this. And they included it in the seven stages. And of course, like I said, it's connected to Saturn, which is the first planet of the <coughs> seven, sorry, the seven <coughs> ascending planets. We start off with Saturn. We start off with lead. And then we ascend from there. Now, calcination actually means to the bone. And in the Azoth picture which I have here, you can see that it shows the bird of spirit with the skull. So that shows the bone. So we are separating out the spirit, the mercury, from the three essentials. That's what the roasting cinnabar experiment is about. And so roasting cinnabar, there's mercury in cinnabar. And what you do is you put it on the fire. And mercury pours out. It cries out of it. It seems to just pour it out and like it seems to be crying from the stone. It's a beautiful thing to see. I think there is a video here on YouTube that you can look up. Yeah, the, you always have to start off with the inner child, with the, the root chakra. And you have to start off with that safety. Once you can make that inner child feel safe, then you can progress to the other stages of alchemy and to the stages of um, personal spiritual development. So if you keep getting the Six of Cups, Megan, you probably do need to work a little bit with your inner child and make sure your inner child feels safe. And there are beautiful YouTube videos that you can use for that. Drop by to say hi. It's rather late here, 1.44 a.m. Have a lovely night. Well, thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful night. It is very late. 1.44 is pretty late. Here it's only 3 o'clock. So, um, the roasting cinnabar, basically the mercury is separated out. You can see it pouring out in the crying type situation, right? And it is part of, an important part of alchemy is separating out that spirit and I really think the spirit lies within the inner child the spirit and the ability to reconnect to that higher group process that group think pretty much what I call the hive mind <laughs> but you have to connect reconnect with that inner child and make sure they're feeling safe and meet those safety needs what is it that makes you feel safe now, part of the process of alchemy, then when it comes to all of this, is that that initial stage that you're in, you're trying to fill a hole. <coughs> I feel see a lot of people describing this, that there's a hole within them. 
they try to fill it with physical luxury, with cars, with a particular career, with having notoriety, with having labels. All of these things are just a way to fill this hole that exists within them. And they don't know why that hole exists. And it's become quite obvious to me in my experience that the reason the hole exists is because of the separation, the illusion of separation. We think we're separate from the Creator, which is not the way that we are in spirit. We can sense and feel and have the comfort of the Creator in spirit. So in this first stage of calcination, we have this burning desire. And that desire we place on people, places, and things. But what it really should be focused on is the Creator. Because that is where the desire truly comes from. But a lot of people will pursue pleasure, thinking that it will fill this hole within them. Thinking that there is something that can fill the hole that's in physical material reality. When there's nothing here that can fill that hole. Now personally, I don't have that hole anymore. <laughs> I filled it up with spirit following this process. That's why I say in a lot of ways discovering alchemy, discovering the chakras, discovering the seven tarot card keys of the seeker really transformed my life. And I feel fulfilled. I stay in a state of gratitude most of the time. State of grace. Is it perfect? Am I perfect? No. Do I have bad days? Yes. Do I get frustrated? Of course. I'm human. We are all human here. If I was completely done with the great work, I would be out of here. And there's too much for me here that I'm attached to. Obviously, my children, my husband, the life that I have, I have a lot of great reasons to be here. I have wonderful friends. Megan, you're one of them that I love to support. So there's a lot for me here. I still have that desire mind, I, but it's not as much as it used to be. This type of desire mind in the devil key, this is the all-consuming type. This is the type that you need to make it. You need other people to validate you. You need something. But nothing in this world is going to fulfill that hole. It's, nothing's going to ever help you take off these chains other than when you do it yourself through the processes of chakras, alchemy, with seven tarot card keys of the seeker. So that is calcination. It precedes the great work. It is the common state that all of us are in. It's what we all start off in. There's a plane flying over, if you can't tell. And this is, there's a lot of noise going on today. <laughs> and this is the state that we actually return to. There is a secret step in alchemy. We return to calcination. We return to Saturn. We return to the limitations. We go off on these journeys, we have this wonderful, beautiful experience, and then we have to come back to Saturn. We have to come back to reality. We have to cross the threshold in the hero's journey back to reality. And then we have to find a way to convey the secrets that we learned from the subconscious, to convey the information that has given us liberation. The final card <coughs> that corresponds to the Philosopher's Stone is the World card. That is the final card of the seven cards of the Tarot card keys of the Seeker. So we gain liberation through this process. But we always still return to Saturn. We still return to limitations. Saturn's limitations because it used to be the limit of the known solar system is the final outer planet that we knew about for a very long time until modern times. So it was considered the outer planet, the limitations. It's what gave form to material reality. And that was the role of Saturn. And so we are all Saturnine beings. And I talked about this before, so I won't go into this again. But we start off with the root chakra, with the inner child, healing there, finding our security, our safety. We don't find security and safety in the real world. It's not material reality that you find that safety. You find that in the realization of the illusion of separation. That you never left the creator. That you can't leave the creator because all that is, is the creation. Uh, this is oneness. And this is the first scent of oneness. You can detect that in calcination. This is where that first 
blush of realizing oneness consciousness comes into place. Because once you realize that the illusion here, the major illusion, this terrible demon that seems to be sitting here, it's just an illusion. That's not real. That illusion is that you're alone. But the truth is, is that the sunrise is for you. The wind is for you. Everything that you encounter is a part of the Creator. And you are never truly alone because the Creator is always here. Everything that you encounter is a part of the Creator. That is a part of oneness consciousness, which you gain with the Philosopher's Stone. That's the part of the new consciousness that comes with the Sun Card Key in fermentation. But here in Calcination, you think you're alone. You, you buy into the illusion that you are all by yourself and that you need something to complete you. Whether that completion is through cars, people, or places, or things, whatever it is, we all pursue something thinking that it will complete us, that it will give us that final validation that explains why we have this hole in our heart, this hole in our soul. So it, its father is the sun. Again, this is a fire sign or fire stage. It is the secret fire of the alchemist is the imagination. And that is why tuning into the imagination is one of the things that helps remove the chains that bind us to this reality, that removes the chains to samsara. Now, the second stage of Negrata is dissolution. The symbol for it is the retort. So this it's this womb-like retort. It almost looks like a drop of water. But this is actually a, a glass. And the material sits here. You put the ashes in here and you boil it. In a, one example is a bain-marie, which is basically a double boiler. And the ash, which is the dross, the excess that has been burned away through calcination, the ashes dissolve. Another way, other than boiling it, that you can do this is through libations, which is basically just adding water at a particular time to the ashes so that they dissolve. And I think all of us have at some point dissolved ashes, perhaps on accident, perhaps when we're putting out a fire at a camp. But you can see that it just dissolves. It's no longer there. It cleans up completely. And whatever is left behind in alchemy, the three things that are left behind are the three essentials. Sulfur, which is the soul. Salt, which is body. And mercury, which is the spirit. And what we're really after in alchemy is the spirit. We're after the mercury. So dissolution's phrase is its mother... Sorry, I have to read this correctly. <laughs> its mother is the moon. And the moon rules the water, right? So that's why it's obvious that this phase involves water. So the first one, the first phrase from the Emerald Tablet is, its father is the sun. The second for dissolution is its mother is the moon. And this relates to Cancer and Aquarius. Now Aquarius might be seem weird because it's the air sign. But it does tie into this phase of alchemy. So, the metal associated with dissolution is tin, which is Jupiter. Now, tin is considered the noble metal. It is the metal that was worn by nobles and aristocracy for an um, age, basically, until there were better metals to use. So, tin is the noble metal. <coughs> and dissolution is the stage where we remove the last of the dross, the last of the excess, the last of the parts of us that are no longer desirable. Now, in Huck's workbook, he explains that this is successful dissolution requires letting go of control. Allowing feelings to flow and repress thoughts and feelings to surface. You might be overwhelmed by images, wordless impressions, and strange feelings. And feel like you're really floating around aimlessly in a giant sea. 
But this is only a temporary process in the long road to, to renewal and perfection. So this stage, as you can tell from the tower card, unleashes the subconscious waters. And this is the dark night of the soul. So before is the common stage that all of us are in. The common burning and pulverization that we go through day in, day out, that leads to burnout. The parts that, you know, that needful hunger, the hungry ghost, as they describe it in Buddhism. We are all hungry ghosts, craving something, some sort of connection, some sort of deeper meaning to it all. And then when we build up a tower, we build up this sense of self, this perception of who we are, and it's torn down. And it's torn down by spirit on purpose. We can build it up as many times as we want. And believe me, I built it up several times. I've had a few careers. I had great friends at different jobs that I moved on from. I had, I've had different lives in this life. I would build an identity. And because Pluto is in my first house of Capricorn, it would get pulled down like crazy. So I've had a lot of tower moments. And these tower moments come to everybody. This is not anything that is particular to you. It is not because you are some sort of lackluster person or you've attracted this because you're a bad person. In fact, the tower moment is an opportunity. It's a beautiful opportunity to let go of the excesses of this world, the excess parts of you. It's a wonderful time to get rid of clutter to clean the house out, to throw away out things that don't bring you joy. I can't remember the name of the woman who says, whenever you pick up an object, ask yourself, does this bring you joy? And if not, get rid of it. Donate it, throw it away, whatever you want to do. But if it doesn't bring you joy, why do you continue to lug it around in your life? And that's where you realize this is in the tower card. This is the breakdown moment. So... <laughs> The Negredo stage, the black stage, is one of purification. You start off like everybody else, being pulverized, burnt down to ash. Burnout is normal, it's common, it's actually part of the process. And then you have the dark night of the soul, where you have everything just tumble down, everything break apart. And this is an opportunity, this is part of the purification, because this is the last bits of you that you don't need. Now... People can stay in this black stage. They can stay in the grado. They can bounce back and forth between these incessantly. They don't have to proceed to the next stage of albedo. Or beto is what it's actually called. And we're going to discuss that in the next one. But dissolution, the symbol is the retort, which is womb-like. Its mother is the moon. It relates to ten, which is the noble metal. So this is not considered a particularly negative stage. And what does Jupiter do? Jupiter is the planet. Jupiter expands. This is the sacral chakra, which is associated with the gonads. So this has to do with your reproductive organs. We have the opportunity to reproduce if we want. We don't have to, <laughs> but we have the ability to multiply. And that is what the sacral chakra's energy is about is it's really about growth, expansion, and sharing our energies with others. So Jupiter is all about that. It makes things bigger. Now Cancer, ruled by the moon, is the sign associated with this. That is the primary sign. <coughs> Excuse me. And Cancer is an emotional sign. It is the sign of emotions. And water involves emotions. As D.W. Huck said, you may feel like you're going to be washed away by dissolution. And this is a stage where you're going to cry. And it's okay to cry. Crying is a good thing. It clears out a lot of toxins from your system. Not just physically, but emotionally. You don't even have to know why you're crying. Sometimes it's just good to do a good cleansing where you just put on TV a sad movie and just cry just to let go of those emotions and things that just need to get away from you. So I wanted to share regarding dissolution. Oops, someone's trying to come in here. Shelly, 
Mom's doing YouTube. Oops. The kids are taking over. So dissolution is actually... Please close the door, Michelle. Ross, can you close the door, please? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So it's stage dissolution in Paul Foster Case's um, work is actually stage 11. And I lost my bookmark, it seems like. Oh, there we go. All right. Now he connects it to solution. But says Ripley, we dissolve into water which does not wet the hand. And he tells us, too, that solution is the cause of congeliation. Now, to congeal is to freeze or to render solid by the lowering of temperature. All solids, and I lost my spot here. All solids are congealed fluids. This water, this Walter Wassel, who has had independent insight into the alchemical work, says, Man's dependable realities are but the ices of substances. So, basically, and I go into this on the medicine wheel when it comes to direction of water. Water has three different phases. There's the ice phase which congeals and there's the phase of where it's actually water and there's the phase of vapor. So man's dependable realities are but the ices of substances. What that means is that we freeze our reality. We freeze our perception of reality. And at this phase of dissolution, those frozen perceptions of reality are melted down. They're reduced to water. So we think that we have this solid structure. We think we have this solid reality. What better way to describe the awakening, really, than you go from thinking everything is solid and real, and then you come across things like the Mandela effect. And you go, wait a second. I thought the Monopoly guy had a monocle. I thought it was Berstein Bears, or Berenstein, Stein Bears, not Berstein, Stein Bears. These little things that just don't seem quite right, that you play with your memory. You, you think that reality is solid, but reality is actually very fluid. And alchemists can connect in with that fluid. And if you flow with dissolution, if you allow it to melt your reality, if you allow it to allow to dissolve, the structures that you've built of reality in your mind, then it actually allows things to flow more naturally. It allows you to flow more naturally because you're not thinking things are a certain particular way. You're not defining things and la putting labels on things as much. You realize that everything is fluid. And so the ices of our reality, so you might as well have a tower made of ice, basically, in the tarot card key, because that's what's falling here. And so are all things which man knows and sees and feels and stand upon and builds upon, and upon which he relies as true and staunch and real and everlasting. All are but as ice, and at their respective melting points, as reliable as ice. If this planet did not know a temperature above that which keeps ice solid, man's concept of ice would have as much stability as his concept of granite. So it goes on that all solids have their several melting points or points of liquefaction. We look at gold and we think of gold as solid. But gold can be a liquid just as much as mercury at a certain temperature. And he points that out here. And that is one of those clues to the alchemical process. Because here in these two first phases of purification... And it's hard to think of that first phase of calcination as purification, but that's part of purification. In the dissolution phase, we're really seeing the three essentials. We're seeing the mercury. We're seeing the salt. We're seeing the sulfur. We're seeing them all as independent of one another. So <clears throat> we have built this personality for ourselves. We have this tower. This is my personality. I am a white woman living in Southern California with a degree. And so I must be, you know, a career person, right? You think that's a solid reality. You think that's solid, dependable reality. But things come along to dissolve that. The degree, you can live or would live without the degree. You can still live without it. 
the fact that I'm a white woman can't change that. Can't change that I live in Southern California either, although I could move. But it does define who I am. So there will be things that come up in my reality that will throw a little bit of a wrench in that process. For example, finding out that I'm indigenous. Finding out that I'm Ashkenazi Jewish. So I'm extremely mixed. <laughs> so I can't really perceive myself. I don't know what to reply when things ask me what my race is. I don't know. <laughs> I'm unsure <laughs> is what I put, basically. Because I am a mix. A real big mix. I'm Asian. So... That construct in my mind, when I actually got my genealogy, kind of went out the window. Because I realized I'm a lot more than just one race, one nationality. I'm a whole mix. So I can't build my personality off of that. I can't build my personality off my degree either. Because I don't use it. And when you don't use a degree and you don't have those uh, positions that have used it, you're going to start from the bottom again when you go back into the field. That's the type of stuff that happens to dissolution. You realize that you are not something that can really be defined. You're not something that actually can be labeled. You're fluid. And those are all nice to define yourself when you're working with and helping other people. I could define myself as an alchemist. In a lot of ways, I am an alchemist. That is primarily what I do here on YouTube. If I meet someone and they ask me what I do for a living, I'm not going to say I'm an alchemist. I'm going to say I'm a mother, stay-at-home mother. But even then, that's going to change. That's going to fall apart eventually because my children will leave the nest. And a lot of empty nesters, that's their problem. They built their identity on their child. And when they leave home, that falls apart. They have that tower moment. Often later in life when it's harder to adapt to it and use that dissolution towards spiritual advancement. So dark nights of the soul come to all of us. There are a few things that I've learned once I, I think I've said this before and I've shared this elsewhere. <coughs> but when you're in a dark night of the soul, the first thing is don't take it personally because it happens to everyone. Everyone has tower moments. The second thing is to know it's only temporary. Nothing ever stays the same in this reality. That is one of the greatest blessings when you realize that. Everything is in a constant state of dissolution, constantly dissolving. The building that was there 20 years ago probably isn't there today. Some things are last a lot longer than that, but a lot of things disappear. I've seen a lot of people, I, <laughs> when you're driving around with an elderly person, they'll tell you there used to be a, let's think of a, a Radio Shack that used to be right there when I was a kid. I bought my first CD there or something. Those types of things happen. But that Radio Shack is gone. Where did it go? In Buddhism, there's the same idea. And that is that life is temporary. That things aren't really physically there. They're not solid. We look at reality, we think it's solid, that's real. And dissolution is where you have that feeling of, oh no. It's not real. It is not as solid as you think. It's far more fluid. It's kind of like the economy. When you first look at the economy, you think the economy is this solid thing. Very dependable. And then you get into the actual details of it. And you start to discover certain things. Such as the health of the economy as far as the nation that you live in is determined by the GDP. The gross domestic product. The total amount of money that's made in the nation basically and the products made the value of the country is determined by the value of the products that it actually creates but what's really important to people on an individual level is the cpi which is a consumer price index which is a basket of goods it's the price of milk the price of eggs so when you're watching tv you're getting all this information about the economy from the gdp point of view when what really matters to you is the cpi that's one way there's a huge disconnect about perceptions of the economy. And the more you get into it, you realize that money is just paper. It's made up. It's a made up number, especially nowadays with banks. They can create you an account and say you have $1,000 in it because you deposited $1,000. Take your $1,000, invest it in something else, and still let you take money out at the ATM. That's how banks work. 
they are basically borrowing money against what you put in. And when you realize that, you can see how quickly the economy could be changed to benefit everyone. I'm not saying I have an idea of how to solve the economy, but you realize that it's fluid. You think it's a solid structure, but it becomes very fluid when you actually look into the details of it, and that transforms your point of view. And you can apply that to everything in our reality. It just dissolves. Think of the indigenous Americans. They didn't understand the ideal of owning land. And they're still very much not for it. But we have our little plots of land that we live on and we maintain. That's just the process that the um, Europeans brought with them. So you can have two different realities coexisting at once. And in dissolution is that moment where you can start to peer into other realities. You can peer into other perceptions of reality. So that is pretty much what I wanted to cover. I'm going to see if there was anything else. So dissolution. The purpose of psychological dissolution is to dissolve rigid beliefs and name remains of ego falsity that hold back the powerful subconscious. Waters of the subconscious mind, tremendous energy can be generated when the waters held back are released as the ego is humbled by its direct confrontation with the primal energies of the unconscious. This is D.W. Huck. Successful dissolution requires letting go of control, allowing feelings to flow. So you're releasing those solid eye structures. You're releasing those solid perceptions that you just want to hold on to so much. And then Paul Foster Kays. Alchemical dissolution reduces all solid bodies and, and man's experiments into their elemental waters. This process is meditation, which enables one proficient in it to change his consciousness of any solid that condenses into essential spiritual substance, the alchemical water. Again, we have this idea of going from ice to water. And that's basically what happens when you have a dark night of the soul. You think that you have solid foundation. You think that you have things figured out in your life. And you have this identity. You've defined yourself. You have all these labels. And then something comes and washes it all away. And you start over again is what most people do. So you can bounce back and forth, like I said, between calcination and dissolution your whole life or you can step into the next phase which is beto or albedo and i will go into that phase in the next video but i just wanted to cover negredo to start with because it is the phase of purification it is the phase of dissolution and it is one that most of us are familiar with so are there any questions oh there was one other thing that I forgot and I wanted to go over. When it comes to the three essences, we're going to go through the four elements as we progress through the seven stages of alchemy. And the well, as we progress through the four stages or phases of alchemy. But there may be four phases and you may wonder, okay, does this associate with the four elements? How does the four elements come into play? And I wanted to say that the three essences are... Salt, which is earth, which is the body. Sulfur, which is the soul, which is air. Mercury, which is the spirit, which is water. And then the alchemical fire is the fire element. So even though we are reducing our substance down to three elements, the three essentials, the fourth element is there in the form of the fire, the alchemical fire, which the true imagination is the alchemical fire. So I wanted to add that in there because that's another realization that I had recently. Because I was wondering if the four elements were actually involved with the three essentials. And it is because fire is the one thing that continues throughout the alchemical process. And dissolution is the fire below the banmarie that boils the water, that dissolves the ashes. So that is an important part of alchemy. So that is pretty much what I wanted to cover. Yes. So when it comes to the fixed zodiac signs, 
I have Capricorn, which is also fixed. So I understand. So how do I see this affecting the fixed zodiac signs? I have Taurus and Scorpio in my natal chart, and you mentioned the idea of releasing control. So definitely, it's easier for me because I have a Cancer sun, but you have to release control in order to move to the next stage in dissolution. And you're releasing that control to a higher power. You're realizing that there is something bigger than you. Something that is not orchestrating your life. Because like I said, the secret in the Kabbalah and probably in alchemy, because Kabbalah and the alchemy and alchemy are very closely related. The alchemists studied the Kabbalah. So in alchemy and in the Kabbalah, the creator is not directly influencing life. But you do have a higher self that is watching over you. So you need to release control to that higher self. So when things happen that are outside of your control, things that you can't do anything about, what you need to do is realize that this is happening for your highest good for some reason. Maybe in the moment you can't connect with why it's happening for your highest good. But at the end, after the process is over, you'll be able to say this is for my highest good. When we come to the tower phase, one of the most common things to do is say, why me? Why is this happening to me? And the tower happens, those tower moments happen to wake you up, to shake you up, to shake you out of reality. In the indigenous tradition, it's the coyote. Coyote is shaking you out of reality, making you laugh, but making you realize that there is something more than you in your reality. And you need to surrender to that. Surrender is a huge part of the spiritual process. I experienced the Mandela effect. What exactly is happening in dissolution? Your work is interesting. So reality is fluid. It is not fixed. There are billions of people here on the earth and there are billions of reality. Our reality is defined, and this is according to psychology, based on our experiences and unique experiences. And those make us a unique person with unique responses. So technically, there's billions of people here with billions of reality that overlap with one another. So this person may never have seen the Monopoly guy with the monocle, but this one did. And those two realities overlap. And sometimes they clash with one another because <coughs> those two people encounter one another. So in dissolution, you start to realize how fluid reality is. And that's how manifestation works. You're pressing, you're projecting your energy onto reality to get a certain result through manifestation. By changing your own frequency, by changing your own energy, you have a different outer reality experience because it is so fluid. I'll have to think of a better way to describe that, CG. But dissolution, is it's there to wake you up. Whenever you see a Mandela effect, you're going, what? why is this happening? Why me? Why am I the one who remembers this being different? And it's to wake you up to the reality that there's a bigger reality out there, a bigger consciousness than yours. The process of alchemy is really the reorientation of the soul back towards the creator. It is the tearing apart of your structures of your mind, tearing them apart to find those three essentials, sulfur, salt, and mercury. So that mercury, instead of salt, can be your main focus. If you focus on the body and the pleasures of the body, you will never find fulfillment. If you turn to spirit, you turn to that higher power, to that higher self, and start to reorient back towards the creator. Eventually your higher self will do so as well. Then you transform your life. And that is the ultimate goal of alchemy, is to reorientate, to realize there is more here than physical material reality. That you have a spirit, that you're a soul, that you're a soul having a human experience that is temporary. But you have an eternal soul, an eternal life. That is, to me, the true resurrection, is when we realize that. So Mandela effects happen to wake you up so that you have tower moments. Are there any more questions before I sign off? My phone is dying and the kids are waiting. I'll give you guys a few moments. I know that there's always a little delay here. I've gone on for an hour. Holy moly.
I didn't realize it was going to be an hour video. All right. So to answer your question, how does this affect the fixed signs of the zodiac signs? It's the same way that it affects everybody else, Meg. We all have this process of letting go and surrender to spirit. Now, the reason why there's a zodiac sign associated with this is because it's associated with the moon and water. And so this is the, we all go through, every year we all go through the different alchemical 12 stages. That's normal. That's why when I am going over the 12 steps of alchemy, I said that is the wide path. And the seven stages are, is the more narrow path that you can take. So I don't see any more questions. I have to head out because my phone's about to die and the kids are waiting. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining me. This has been really fun. It's been really neat to have people here. It's good to see you, CG and Meg. Thank you again, Stephen, for joining us when you did. And to everyone who watches this, thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe. If you're not a subscriber and watching this, don't forget to hit like. It really does help with the algorithm. And I appreciate all of you being here. Bye for now.